that's just on time, or level five, whatever time it is. It's time for church. Who ate too much this week? Every one of you didn't raise your hand. Is lying? Ain't that right, Rob? All right. So in honor of that, what we're going to do, we're going to sing the wonder story. 535 in the book, on the screen. Whatever it is, we're going to sing the wonder story. Everyone stand. right here. Can you hear me now back here? Okay. Can you hear me? Hallelujah. It's turned on. Praise the Lord. Um, as, as we're here today, so glad y'all are here. Praise the Lord. Y'all know we have many of our families that's got the, uh, the flu right now. Uh, several of them are, are out with the flu. I want you to keep them in your prayers. I also want you to remember Brother Eddie. Uh, um, Brother Eddie's got some different health issues we want to lift up. Just pray for him uh, in the name of Jesus just for a total healing. Uh, also, uh, I want you to remember Brother Ellis as he is speaking at uh, Mars Hill. He's speaking at Mars Hill today. So keep him and his families in your prayers. And then, of course, in your bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, you need to get you a bulletin. Inside are some uh, very important events and different things that are coming up. I want you to remember uh, all of that, please. And uh, what else we got? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Miss Sherry, how many shoe boxes we end up shipping? 161. 161. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. And we also, uh, so that's part of our, our missions field is uh, that's distributed. And hopefully some of y'all be contacted. If you get contacted, I want to encourage you to uh, just tell us. And uh, we would love just to report on that. If the Lord opens that door up, who knows? Also, I want you to remember Lottie Moon's coming up. So if you don't know anything about Lottie Moon, we, it's a uh, big missions program. And Connie's going to say something about Lottie Moon. Well, sit back being quiet. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. You ain't going to be quiet. Yes, <laughs>
school. It's going to be with the children. So if you'd like to come and support them, and everything that they make will go to the Lottie Ministry. It's just going to help spice it up a little bit. Praise so let's see some lattes go. Some lattes for Lottie. And, then, and uh, what time will that be? Before Sunday school. Before Sunday school. So it gives you a wonderful opportunity right there to, to just be a part. And so if you don't know what Lottie Mooney is, Lottie Mooney is the world's mission. It delivers the gospel of Jesus Christ around the entire world. Your money, 100%, goes to the missionaries. 100%. All right? So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a, a, something that should be important to us about reaching uh, the families around the world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Anything else? Brother Sonny? Yes, I was uh, just wondering what this picture is up here. This picture right here? What is this picture right here? Miss Glenda, would you like to tell us? Yes, we have, it's a 25 passenger, uh, 24 passenger, 24. Passenger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then if we have more than that, we can take the van. So we'll have a, uh, <coughs> it's, it's the seating in there, you'll have the seating, and just remember, it's young and heart, you want to ride, Clyde, jump on the bus, jump on the bus. We're just going to be singing and praising the Lord and uh, going to see some Christmas lights. That's December the 9th, December, <coughs> this, and what time will that be? At five o'clock. All right. So remember that. Anybody else? Well, just Linda would give the tattoo thing on her head instead of paint. I think we we'll get more people showing oh, <laughs> permanently marred. <laughs> permanently marred. Let's uh, let's open up in prayer and we'll we'll start our service this day in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much, God. Lord, just what a glorious day that we have to gather together to lift your name up on high, Father, to celebrate you, Lord, during this Christmas season, Father. I just pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to so many hearts. The Father, the needs are great. I, I'm so thankful, Lord, for all the Christmas boxes that went out, Lord. And we just pray and continue to pray that, Lord, I know it takes a while to get to these families, but I pray we'll bless them and that the gospel message will, uh, Lord, pierce their hearts. And, Lord, even around here, as we remember our cause, what we're called to do, Father. Lord, not just be missionaries around out in the world, but right here where we're at. We're praying for our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones, Father, that, Lord, above religion, above tradition, that, Lord, truly that they will see the risen Savior, Christ, Lord, during the Christmas season, Lord, born of a virgin, Father, for, to come for us, the, the greatest Christmas gift. I pray, Father, that as we gather as brothers and sisters, as Brother James was speaking, Lord, and talking about all those who helped out during Thanksgiving, Father, I pray, Lord, that we look at our neighbors as opportunities to help out. Some need a little firewood. Some need a little help in different areas, Father. And may we always be seeing what's taking place. And, Lord, we have some of our friends and neighbors that aren't feeling well today, and we lift them to you, Father. Uh, Brother Rhett, we just lift him up, Lord, as he's on the second round of chemo, Father. We're praying in the name of Jesus that those cancer cells be removed from his body, Lord, that he'll be healed, Father. 
Uh, we pray, Lord, for Brother Ellis as he's delivering the gospel message at Mars Hill, that you will bless him, use him, Lord, uh, that it will pierce their hearts. And we pray for that revival down there in Louisiana, Father, uh, Lord, in Hammond. I pray, Father, that that tent revival will continue to over three weeks. I pray, Father, that revival will continue to go, that souls be saved, people will be delivered, Father. Lord, I pray for that pastor. Uh, Lord, I know he must be getting tired as he's been speaking every night. Bless him, Lord. I pray, Father, that, Lord, not because of who he is, but who his God is, that, Lord, people will see just what it means to be, Lord, delivered, Father, to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, as, as we come, we pray, Father, that this whole building will be just filled with your spirit. Bless those who are watching our nursery and we'll be doing our children's church, Father. May we never take it for granted the sacrifices of others to minister to the needs of our children and our grandchildren and, and those who surround us, Father. What a great calling of ministry, each one of these positions. Lord, use Brother Tyler today as he comes and sings and all these instrument players, Father. They do it, they do it as a, a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of worship, Father. All this choir who's given so much as they prepare for cantatas. And, and Lord, even for this practice today, Father, bless them, Lord. May our hearts be warmed by your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I would like to fill that right there. I ain't kidding you.
But the only reason we can live by faith is because of his faith. If he, if he is not faithful, then what good is our faith? That's right. He's faithful, and our faith is coming true. Lord. Great is his faithfulness to us.
we've all had our Thanksgiving and we've gone through this time of year. We all know the saying that you should never have just one day that you thank. But you know what our problem is? Is we're not willing to ask God for what we need. There's nothing in our lives that's too big for God. The same grace that helps me find a bolt when I'm working on a car is the same grace that heals cancer. Because with God, there's nothing different. So always remember, you can't ask too much of my God. promise right there and understanding that you cannot ask too much of God. Praise the Lord for all them babies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where is your phone? I don't know. If you'll open your Bibles up to Matthew. That's the 
secret code. You can join the club too, but you must have an interview with a whistling test. Even Tegan has already surpassed the whistling test. That's a failure. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. If you could stand with me just a moment. I've used this, this scripture a lot, I reckon, through the years. It's one of my favorites. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Let's use that as our opening verse in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much, God, just, just with the knowledge of knowing that we cannot ask too much of you, that you're only <laughs> a voice away, a heart away, for it says you know the moans and groans of our hearts that you understand us. And Lord, even when we don't know the words to say, the Holy Spirit interprets it for us. Lord, as we meet today, we meet coming together, Lord, as the body of Christ, knowing, God, that you're right here with us. Speak to our hearts that we might glorify you in every one of our actions and deeds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Not far from where my daughter lives in Missouri, um, there's, there's several locations. You can be driving along. You leave a city of over 600,000 a day. Uh, there and, and you can go in any direction within about 20 some minutes you can be in a areas you didn't even know anybody existed I got up one day and I, I said well you know I'm a I'm a drive before Thanksgiving and I wanted to look at some land up there in a particular area uh, a very remote area and I like to go and, and just drive I, I go anywhere I just take off and just drive everybody makes fun of me saying you're always gonna get lost but I always find my way back home praise the Lord but when I, I was going up there uh, I did not realize the location I was going to. I didn't do a lot of research on it. I just decided I'm gonna drive over there and look at some land. And as I was driving though, it's, it was very, very hilly. And as I come over that hill, lo and behold, guess what's up in the middle of the road? Not a deer, not a cow, bear. but there was a, not a bear, <laughs> they had signs, not a bear, but there was a wagon. And what it was, it was an Amish community. And I didn't realize it was an Amish community, so I almost killed a whole Amish family with, you know, and all they got is this little red marker. Well, when you, you drive Mississippi style going over that hill, you know, you're trying to get to that location. But anyway, praise the Lord. God's always with me. He's with you also. And I'd asked him to lead me where I should go that day. So I, I knew then, once I seen an Amish, I said, well, this ought to be interesting. And lo and behold, I come up and I see a, a store. I passed it because I was um, going a little bit pretty good clicks. I couldn't apply my brakes quickly enough to turn around, but I went back to a grocery store there, or I guess you'd say an Amish store, and as I went there, they had lots of horses and uh, their carts right there parked, and as I was going in, I was looking for a specific pie. Now, we don't have it down south here. It's called gooseberry. You know, I know y'all haven't heard of that, but it's a particular pie they introduced me when I used to pastor up there years ago. It's very sour, and I like sour foods, so I went in there, and uh, I met this, this woman. I says, uh, asked about gooseberry. She says, I'll get you one. And the woman went back there and cooked me a gooseberry pie. <laughs> now, I was, had already been on the internet looking for this gooseberry pie, and uh, they wanted 60 to $70. Does any of y'all know me for a pie? <laughs> y'all think I'm giving 60 to $70 no gooseberry pie? But that woman went back there, and she cooked me with the Amish things, and she cooked me a gooseberry pie, and she come out, she put it in a nice box. It was hot. Eight dollars. Love the store. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and when I left there, I went. I was starting driving down there. I'm, I'm feeling successful. I've done succeeded, as far as I was concerned. And I'm going down the road. Though. I'm going to this place, and uh, it has an Indian name to it. So I stopped because I wanted to go to school. I want to know what's going on in them school dinner. I don't have no kids in school, but I still like to know what's going on in the community. And when I stopped in this community, uh, I stopped at a store, and I didn't even know it was one of them Amish store things. And uh, they were selling Amish things. But I get in there, and I, there was a, a, a mother and her daughter, and I could tell she was in high school. And I'm going on. I'm asking about different things in there and the beauties of all the creations they had. And uh, these were people reselling Amish supplies. And as I was there, I, was, I asked her about, I said, well, I asked the, uh, the young lady, I said, well, how big is your school? And she started talking to me, and she was talking about how many kids went there. And it's a very remote, really not far from a big city, but it's still it looks remote. How about that? It looks, it looks remote. 
And she said, you know, the great thing about this school, it, it rates real high in its tests and all this. And the mother got, she says, and we teach Christian curriculum. I said, wait, you're, whoa, stop. So what do you mean you teach Christian curriculum? I said, you know that the government will give you trouble. And she says, I'm telling you, we're more concerned about how our children are going to affect our community than we are how the government's going to affect us legally. And she says, we have been teaching biblical Christian history of America, and we teach Christian science, and we're not scared of what the government is saying. Now, how many times have you heard that? Right. You don't hear that very often. And what I got to thinking about was how they were more concerned with the influences of their children in their community than they were with anything else. And when I went around there, you could tell, because their school was, it was, even though it's a rural community, uh, it was very well kept, and it was well thought of. You could see it. Salt is something that permeates when we're cooking in South Louisiana. We use salt and everything, and y'all do too. And one of the great things about sauce is, salt is how it's used to affect every part of your life. We take it for granted because we get it so cheap here, but it hasn't always been that cheap. It hasn't always been... Uh, the way we think of it. But salt has the ability to, to change the flavor of food. It has the ability to, to, to affect everything around it. It has the ability if you apply salt to a wound to draw out infection. Salt has the ability to even uh, spread heat if you put it in a stove and stuff. Salt is something very unique. When I was in Epi, Louisiana, one of the things, I uh, had a, a lady there, and they always drink coffee all day from, from daylight to midnight. And, you know, one tablespoon of sugar will sweeten your coffee, right? But have you ever had somebody put a tablespoon of salt into your coffee? Well, I'm going to tell you, you recognize the difference. Sugar is, is sweet, but sweet does not affect this world. Sweet is not what's going to transform society. What happens with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the salt is what is used right here to describe it. It permeates every part of it. The reason the world is trying to silence the born-again believers of Jesus Christ is because you have the ability to transform the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. But if we don't do it, if we don't do what our calling is, if we don't understand how important the Christian influences are in our community, what you see is the world gets darker. As we place our light up under a basket, as we hide how Christ has affected us, as we try to disguise ourselves in society to look like them, the world grows bolder. The ingredients of society that's needed today is salty Christians that are willing to walk into this dark world. We're the salt of the earth is what it says in the Bible. We're the people that should make a difference, and we have responsibilities to see that the earth is permeated with the gospel of Christ. We have the responsibility to be bold under the threat of persecution. We have the responsibility to stand up and say what's wrong is wrong and not think or let them intimidate us by what they say when they start calling you a bigot or something like that. A lot of times, we don't look at it, but the churches have lost their saltiness. We've lost uh, our, our usefulness, as the way it's described in the Word of God. And it should be something that really catches our attention. You know, when you, when you understand, you start thinking, well, what was Jesus thinking about? And that society back in that day, salt was so important, it, it was so special. And a lot of times in the homes, they would take and they would have their ovens on the outside because they didn't want to bring the heat inside. But they would have ovens made, kind of like what you would see today. It would be like a fancy pizza oven, but that's where they would cook their bread at. But they would have tiles inside, and underneath those tiles was salt that spread in there. And that was to distribute the heat evenly throughout that entire oven. Now, 
what's interesting about that is that over a period of time, the salt is literally burned out. And when it's burned out, they would take the tiles up, they would scoop up all this salt that was so needed, that was so important, and they would just throw it next to their house. Now, everybody would see these white piles of salt, even when they're doing uh, these, these digs today to, to look up history and stuff. They can still find these piles of salt, but they were totally useless for what they needed them for. Even though it was considered salarium, it was considered a money at one time, even though it was something that was valuable, even though there were so many uh, important factors of salt, that salt was totally burned out. And what we have to look at in our lives, are we totally burned out? Are we going to be cast aside? Do, have we taken our influence and given it away? So Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, if, they, if we cease to be the Christian influence that we should be, that we're called to be, that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to be, that we're good for nothing. You ever heard of something described as, well, that's good for, that hound dog is good for nothing. I'm telling you what, thing won't run, a rabbit won't tree a squirrel. It's good for nothing. We ought to just take it out and shoot it. Well, I heard that growing up all my life. But have we ever looked at ourselves in that perspective of thinking we're like something that should be cast out on the side that has no purpose, that has no reasons, that we've lost our saltiness, that we should be trampled under the feet of men because we don't even know our purpose anymore and we're afraid and we duck down. Now, Jesus, when he was, he was looking at this, he could have been thinking about, you know, with the, the, the sea over there, the Dead Sea. Uh, Brother Ellis had went there, and several of you have been there in, in your travels, and you go to Israel, and they have this large sea. And this sea over there, and this thing is, is, is so wide, it's 50 miles long, and it's 10 miles wide. But it's, it, the salt is so uh, dense in this waterway, it's called the Dead Sea. Nothing is able to live on it. Matter of fact, if you lay on it, you can literally float upon this particular sea. Jesus might have thought about this possibility because they would always go around this sea, but when people were around the sea, they just thought of it as nothing. Even though they needed salt, that salt was considered useless. That salt was considered hopeless. That salt was something they just trodden under feet, and they would not use it. It's a lesson. A lot of times in our lives, we lose the flavoring that we should be having on our neighbors and our community and even on our government. Don't let people lie to you and say, Christians have no influence in the government. That's a separate entity. Let me tell you something. That's the reason we're in the shape and condition that we're in today is because we've lost the perspective that the Christian should vote like a Christian. The Christian should stand in the midst and shout, no matter what, no matter what anybody says to us, that Jesus saved us. Now, here's what we'll say. Well, no one will vote for me. Well, that tells you why you're a missionary. That tells you why when the United States has grown afraid to stand up for their Christian beliefs because somebody won't vote for us. That means we've, we've lost our influence. When we, when we lose that influence for the Lord, what purpose do we have? It's like being a part of the Dead Sea. We've lost our, uh, the reason of our calling by Jesus Christ. It says that I'm the salt of the earth. It says I should be permeate, that we should be influenced this for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, listen. We used to take, and if you had an infection, you know, my mama was a big believer in uh, really sturdy medicine. Hot, scalding water. You step on a rusty nail, you could get salt water uh, that was so hot it felt like it was boiling your skin off. And she would put salt in that. And that was, she says, that will draw out the infection. Look at your world. Look at what's taking place. You see, as a born-again believer, we're that individual that's able to draw out the infection through the power of the Holy Spirit. What's damaging our homes, what's damaging our families, what's damaging our society is an is a infection of sinfulness. So salt is something that they use to preserve things. It's, it creates a thirst in us and also cleanses. So when we're in society, it should be because we're preserved by the power of the Holy Spirit that we go in there and that we create a thirst for the saving knowledge of Christ. 
you see these people that are confused and they, they don't know their identity of their, their boys, their girls, or what all this. Listen, that's happened over the last 10 years. You think that that is something that's been going on forever? I'm telling you, society has been influenced more by tic tac toe and all them other Twitter channels and all this with a confusion to blind people to, for their need of Jesus Christ. And what they've done is they've adopted their lives to reflect what the world says. What does our life reflect? You know, Jesus, when he was looking at us, he might have thought about the calmest practice that, that happened in society because salt was so valuable. That's where you get the word solarium from. It was so valuable uh, years ago that people would take, and you know, we call it thumbing the scale now, where if someone gets a piece of meat and someone puts their thumb to it, it's making it heavier. That's why you make more profit. And now we don't have no meat thing around here, but I'm gonna tell you, that's where the thumbing of the scale comes in. Well, they would take the salt and they would take some kind of white powder or something else that appeared like salt and they would adulterate the real salt. That way you could take less salt and spread it out and make it heavier so that you could make more volume of it for more profit. And by increasing that, the, the weight, you made more money. Jesus knew that the, the adulterated Christian walk, the adulterated uh, Christian family homes, the discipleship of following him uh, was, was terrible for the whole world. You know, when the rich man, he comes up to, to Jesus and he says, I, I want to follow you, Lord. And he says, listen, don't sell all your stuff and come on with me. Now, I'm giving you the redneck version of that, okay? He says, come on, just get rid of all that stuff. And hold it, Jesus. I like the idea of following you for like a weekend or two. But, uh, you know, this lifetime commitment here, because when I sell it, do you understand my family has spent generations making all this? He wasn't willing to turn away. And if we're not careful, we become so adulterated by society, by what we're looking at, by what we allow our children to see, and our, 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 the different ones that we, we say that we love, but we don't take any time to look at what's being broadcast to them over and over and over. It says when, when this takes place, when we, we've lost our, our Christian influence, that we've become good for nothing. We're just going to be cast aside. We're just to be somebody that's trodden underfoot. But Jesus said that we're to be the salt of the earth, that, that we should keep our, our Savior, the taste. We should keep our influence. You know, the, chem, the chemists say that there's over 14,000 uses for salt. And this may be old from the information that I had. And it says that the average person uses four pounds. I'm going to tell you, in Louisiana, uh, I got to thinking about that. We use more in a crawfish boil than that. Amen. And so I know we got more. We put way too much. We, we have a lot of salt in, in every crab boil, crawfish boil, and, and every other critter we boil around there and stuff. But salt has, has two important elements. It's, it's sodium chloride. Jesus was speaking more than just the science of it. He was speaking to them so that he would catch their attention so that they would examine their lives because they understood how much salt was worth and how it transformed their diets and how it was important that it increased their thirst. That's something that we should all look at. So when you look at this salt, the disciples, it's looking at us and it's telling us that we're, show, we're supposed to have a powerful influence. Do you feel like the Christians have lost their influence? Amen. Yeah. Do you feel like you're seeing in society the, 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 the transformation taking place? Just in Mississippi, we're losing over a hundred Southern Baptist churches a year. Now, think if they just had just 30 people in those churches. Just 30. Think of how many people we're losing a year. Why? Is it just because we're in rural areas? No, it's because we're not influencing the families, Amen. the homes, uh, the, the government itself. We've got to be bold. 
We're, we're, we should be powerful in, in our voting block because it should always vote Christ-like. The early Christians, they, they were supposed to be like that salt distributor that I heard about years ago. They, they had a story about this is over there in oh, oh, one in South Louisiana areas. And I had a guy, he's going in there to get a loaf of bread. And the guy he goes into the store, and the, the shells were covered with different kinds of loaf salt, pounds of salt, sacks of salt, rock salt, table salt, every kind of salt. And that guy says, man, you must sell some kind of salt here. He says, he says not really, but that guy that sells me salt. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> Do we know what we're doing? See, a lot of people don't understand what they, what they really need in their homes and their lives. And a lot of times we give them a perspective that really isn't Christ-like. If we're going to be the influencers, we should be positive influencers for the gospel of Christ. Amen. Years ago in Louisiana, they had a, a, these supervisors. And these particular guys, they were in the parish government. And, of course, in Louisiana, there was an investigation going on for malfeasance in office. And out of five, four were convicted of taking bribes and getting kickbacks in their office. Now, what was interesting about the whole story, because that's a common story, was that there was a fifth man that was not. And the prosecutor says, well, well didn't y'all even attempt to ask that, the other guy if he would take a bribe? Didn't you try to get him to receive something extra for what he was doing? They said, no, we had done heard about his reputation that he was a guy that wouldn't take bribes. I want you to just think about that for a minute. Because they thought that he wouldn't even take a perspective of it. They never even went to him and offered it. They never even offered the bribe. Shouldn't that be said of us too? Shouldn't it be said when it comes to Christian conviction that no one even is tempted to send us something or, or try to bait us because they heard of our reputation standing up for Jesus Christ no matter what. There was a, a professor, he, he, had a, uh, he told me when I was in school about a, a man who owned a business and the man had taken on some very unpopular uh, positions in the government and because he did it, they actually, it affected his business. I want you to think about it just a moment. It affected his business. <laughs> Because they were bringing in uh, alcohol into the community. And he said he was against it. And he voted against it every time. So they started boycotting his business. And the professor, who was his pastor also, said, Man, he said, didn't you ever consider just not taking a stance? Just not showing up for that vote and not worrying about it? Why did you do that? He said, because it was right. He said, I was standing on my convictions that the best thing for our community was not alcohol sales, but we could do better in what we were already being effective with. But isn't it always alluring to try to get a little bit more, to get, the, to get these different things that we can get a little bit more money into our community even though it goes against our conviction? See, that's what he's talking about. We're supposed to be that powerful of influence where somebody knows that our stance on Christ is not transformed or changed just because of our position with money or the position of a business. Now, that's a hard thing. That's something that shows you just how influential you, you are with the cause of the gospel message. It says that we're to be this pervasive influence. So when, when salt's left out of food, it, you, you, you notice right off the bat. You know, even in there uh, for Thanksgiving as they were preparing for our left, I noticed that they had all the trays with salt and pepper. That way, everybody, if they didn't think it had enough salt, they were able to salt it to their palate. See, when salt is added to food, it, it permeates, it pervades it, it, it goes through it. It makes it more palatable, more, more enjoyable. So Christians' responsibility is to pervade every, sec every segment of our society, every part of it. We lost it with, you know, at first they started coming up with this crazy stuff in the colleges, right? 
where they were going to get this all confused. You don't know if you're a male or a female. And, and there's like, I don't know, 70 something different kind of genders and all these different things. And no one said nothing. Then they started bringing it to the high school. But it wasn't in my high school, so it didn't matter. So I didn't worry about it too much, right? And now they bring it to the elementary schools. And we're saying, what's taking place? Well, at least it's not in my community. I'm telling you, they're going to make it a law. It's just like when the Nazis had invaded and someone says, well, when it was this group of people, I wasn't one of them, so I didn't stand up. When it was this group of people, I didn't stand up because I wasn't a part of them. And when they came for me, no one else was left to stand. The Christians have to stand before it even gets to our community. Amen. We're to be pervasive, influencing this world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even when it's not comfortable, it calls men and women to repentance, to salvation. It calls us to make stands, even though under the threat of lawsuit. Nobody's to be excluded. Red, yellow, black, and white. It, there's no assignment too hard for the born-again believer who's filled with the Holy Spirit. We're to, to go into the world to make a change. We are called, we're to invade and pervade the whole earth. We're, we're, we're to go with the gospel and say, let me tell you, you what you need in your life is to be saved. Amen. You're, you're to be transformed. You're to be changed. And we're not just to take it. And Listen, there's too many people that have grown to the point where they think if somebody sprinkles a little water on your head, that that's going to be good. That's it. And they have no relationship with Christ. They don't take in perspective of anything. of the God. Jesus says, if you love me, you do what? Keep my commandments. Now, we've been doing this pretty often. Keep the commandments. Keep the statutes. Follow his will. It's one thing to say I love Christ, and I could wear me a little thing around my neck that says, you know, have a, what, what I can, you know, somebody has an image of Jesus on their wall or on a card. But I'm telling you, unless he's transformed your heart, you're having a salt problem. Amen. We're to be permeated. Our, our, our command and, 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 and the covenant with Jesus that we're looking at is a permanent relationship. The Sermon on the Mount wasn't temporary. That wasn't just for that day, that moment. Or, or, or it's a binding contract. As a child of Jesus Christ, Jesus intended for us to be bound with a salt covenant. It's a relationship. It's, and what it does, it includes the fellowship and the responsibility and the permanency of that relationship. We don't like permanency anymore, do we? Nothing seems to be permanent. But in the salt covenant, you are bound in loyalty and commitment. You're bound in your relationship. We're the salt of the earth as long as we have life. As long as I'm breathing, I have the ability to influence others with the message of Christ. I have the ability to do good or bad. It's whether I, I really believe what he says. Do I really Believe what he says. Do I really trust Jesus? How much do I trust Jesus? See, we have a commitment to Christian influence in everything that I do. Not, a, not just because I'm a pastor. Not just because you attend a church. If you're a born-again believer, no matter what, maybe this is the first time you've been here, maybe the second, maybe, maybe you haven't been here ever before. If you're a so-called born-again believer... How is your life influencing others with the gospel? Well, I don't really care, preacher. Well, that's probably where the problem is. That's probably what the whole problem is in the first place. Because you never get made a commitment. A commitment. See, a commitment is something that, that we don't do anymore. They teach people not to do it. I have a commitment, and you have a commitment, if you're a born-again believer, to give your all. For the glory of God. All he's asking you to do is to be feet and hands. All he's asking you to do is share with others the, the importance of Jesus Christ. So years ago I was talking about how the Romans, the, a part of their, their salary was actually salt. And that's where salarium comes from. And it was so important that they would measure out their weight of salt every single month. And they would give it to them. Now, let me ask you a question. As a Christian, are you effective as somebody who's salt? 
How effective? How are you permeating as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you worth your salt? Are you worth what Christ has said is your salary, your salarium, your salt? There's so many wonderful things that happened around the Dead Sea since the times years ago when they couldn't even use it. Most of you know because now uh, uh, women can go to these stores and, and they, they have taken and they've transformed this uselessness, something that they used to step on and, and walk on, and they actually use it in makeup now. And they actually use it for, for just literally hundreds of different purposes. Something that was considered the Dead Sea has been, become a source of livelihood for multi-thousands of people and has even sold here in the United States. See, Christ can come into your life and transform that dead part of your life. You can be backslidden, but you're never too far where Christ can't reach you. You're never too far gone that he can't transform you. You're never too far gone that he can't help you. The, the thing is we have to do is say, Lord, here I am. He knows where you're at. But you're going to say, Lord, here I am. I need your help. I, I need more than what I have today. I'm asking you, Lord, to change me, to give me the, the, a useful life. Now, your usefulness is determined by Christ, not by your particular set of skills, but by Christ. Christ, he comes into our, our lives when, when you're falling in. I was so lost. I, was, I met this lady the other day when she was, she was around 90 years old, and she was asking me, she says, she says, what were you before uh, you were a preacher? I said, well, it depends on how you look at that. I said, I was a hater. <laughs> and she looked at me. I said, y'all use King James. I said, look in there. It has hater. And I says, uh, that's what I was. And she smiled a little bit. I says, I was lost. I said, well, the Lord came into my life and transformed me. I was raised in a church, always in the church. But the church... The church was a good influence. The church left good seeds in me. But it was until I surrendered my life to Christ and asked him to save me. And she looked at me. She says, I understand. See, what God does is he takes bad dudes and he makes them good men. Amen. He takes someone and makes them better than who they were. Christ, he comes into your life and he empowers you, and you become the salt that influences the world for the, for the cause of the kingdom. Are you influencing the world for the cause of the kingdom? Here it is Christmas. Me and Tyler was talking about this earlier. Just to let you know, because I know y'all going to see Christmas is on a Sunday, right? Is that, is that right? Sunday? Sunday. Oh my goodness, don't you have a lot to do that day? Amen. Yeah, you got a lot of toys. You got a lot of people to see. Exactly what is Christmas about? <gasps> the birth of the Savior. Amen. You know what we're going to have on Sunday? <coughs> I'm going to have church. I understand everything. I don't want anybody feeling bad. What, what I want you to understand We've made the holidays more about a holiday than about the gift of Jesus Christ. The, the free gift for all us bad dudes. You probably weren't a bad dude, but you were lost and you were going to hell. And without Jesus, what would you be celebrating? Why would you be celebrating? It's all about Jesus. You've never gone too far, but you, do you recognize it? when you're not a good salt distributor? Do you recognize it when you're not in the place you should be? Won't you come to Jesus? Won't you lay your life at the feet of the Savior and say, help me, Lord, that I'll have influence for your glory? If you could bow your heads for just a moment as Brother Tyler and the musicians come down. These altars are going to be open down here. I know that's a common thing you hear say it all the time. We talk about coming down here, doing things. Would you pray? Would you pray that God would use you? Would you pray that God would change you? 
would you pray? If, if you've never truly given your heart to Christ, maybe, maybe you don't understand what this old preacher's saying. You see, without Jesus, you're lost. All of Christmas is about the light, the coming of the light. We can say we love the Lord. If he says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. It doesn't matter what the government says is legal. It doesn't matter what the government calls moral or immoral. What matters is what Jesus says. What matters is, is that your life be surrendered to him. If you've never repented, said, Lord, I've sinned, save me. I encourage you to do it. If, if you're backslidden and you're not living in the way Christ is, says in his holy word, what are you waiting for? Everybody sees the signs all around us of his return. He's, he's, he's almost back. It, it, I'm telling you, where are you going to be at? Where are you going to be at? I'm telling you, the world is not going to save you. The world's not going to help you. It might make you feel good for a moment, but until you totally give it to him, you're still living in all this miry clay. Today is open for you to let's let the Spirit move. Won't you pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you today and follow what He says? Won't you come this morning? All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence. sing with us now. Just pray in your heart. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus. Take me now. I surrender That's the way the Lord told us to come to him, right? Brother James, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you've allowed us to come here today to be in this fellowship. Lord, we thank you for this. To hear a portion of your word and sing songs to your praise. And I just pray that each and every thing that was done today would be to glorify thy holy name and honor thee. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Lord, that we can come and pray our petitions before you on our, our family members here in our church that are sick and suffering, Lord, from cancer, and Lord, from other things that attack the body, Lord, for those that are elders in our church that are shut in at this time.
time that not able to come, Lord, we just pray for them that you administer them, Lord, in a way that would show the outreach and the love that you have for each one of us. Lord, again, for those that are indifferent to the Spirit, Lord, that heard the word today and failed to move, Lord, we still pray for the moving of 